Well, hi there and welcome. It's great to imagine you out there. My name is Jonathan Faust. I will be guiding the following meditation and Dharma talk. Really grateful that you can be here for this. Before we begin, a couple acknowledgments. First of all, a big thank you to our producers, to Glenn Harrison and Leo Gimo for bringing all this forward and making it available. As well, a big thank you to our mindful movement teacher uh, preceding this session and to our mindful dialogue leaders after this session. The whole Monday night experience, if you are so interested, Eastern Standard Time at 6, 6.30, you can join Mindful Movement led by three wonderful teachers, one of three, not three at the same time. And that'll bring you right here to uh, guided meditation at 7.30. At 8, I launch into my diatribe that ends at 8.45. And somewhere around 8.50, if you like, you can join Mindful Dialogue led by Ray Maniocchi and Tara Cassidy which is an opportunity to talk about your practice, to talk about the, the talk, whatever might be on your mind. A nice little community gathering. Feel free to check it out. The inf information for those links is on my website at jonathanfaust.com and on Facebook, my Facebook page. So feel free to check that out. Big thank you to the Insight Meditation Community of Washington for hosting this class and all they do. To my good friends at the Unitarian Universalist Church of Arlington, which has been the home of Monday Night Meditation for so many years. Also to let you know, I do have a mailing list. If you would like a monthly compendium of talks with my best photographs for the month, you can sign up on my website. There's also a weekly if you're interested. And just to let you know that this is all offered freely. There's really offered in the spirit that no one's ever denied access to these practices and teachings. It was kind of outlined, um, taught by the Buddha back in those days. The, the practices are considered priceless, so there's no charge. They're offered freely, and um, donations help make this whole thing work. So thank you for helping to underwrite this and make it available for people who don't have access to this stuff. You know, there's so much of, um, of these practices that are, that are for charge and therefore make it inaccessible for others. So thank you. Thank you for all that. Uh, let's see. So we're going to explore the kind of the fundamentals of these working these two wings of practice in this in the transformational journey, uh, primarily exploring the practice of rain. So uh, I'm really looking forward to diving into this. We'll jump into some of the nuances of how it works, have some time for reflection. But before we do that, we are going to practice, have some time for, for meditation. So as you're ready, uh, you might want to make sure your cell phone is set on stun, make sure you won't be disturbed, explain to your animals that you're going to be disappearing for a little while, anyone nearby. And as you're ready, take a little time to, oh, I don't know, let your body stretch, let your body move in any way. It's nice to reach the arms up overhead, stretch them around, deepen your breath, let out any sounds. <clears throat> and as you're ready, if you like, you can close your eyes. Not a strict requirement you have your eyes closed, but many people find it's easier to go inward when your eyes are closed. So as you close your eyes, just take a moment to explore what's what's right here, what's right now. And one of the most powerful ways to do this is to turn your attention to the senses. So you might, one of my favorite ways to begin a meditation practice, let your attention open to the sounds all around you. Notice the sounds the closest, the sounds right at the very furthest edge of your capacity to hear. And the, the metaphor for sound, as it applies to meditation, is first to realize the sounds are changing, the law of impermanence. Noticing that when your mind fixates on the sound, it loses all the other sounds. 
And conversely, when you keep your awareness open without without really fixating, you can take in the totality of the sounds. And you might sort of explore that now. Can you hear all the sounds, the vibration of sound? The third quality here with sounds is noticing that they are not personal. They're just happening, and you happen to be the one who is aware of them. And these qualities of remembering how sounds are constantly changing. How when you just fixate on one, you lose the rest. And conversely, when you stay open, you take in the flow of sounds. And third, that the sounds are not personal, are very helpful to remember because they apply in our practice. Everything is changing. And whenever the mind fixates or gets attached to one thing, it it loses a sense of the whole. And when there is rather a sense of openness, there's a more of a sense of open awareness. And how everything passing through is just simply phenomena. There are weather systems passing through. Who you are is awareness itself. And you might now, if you like, feel your breath. Notice where you feel the breath on the inside. We'll take some time to explore this sense of intimately encountering the here and now by exploring what could soften the forehead, the temples, the muscles around the eyes. And you might sense from the inside the muscles of the face. Imagine there a softening, a smoothing. Noticing the jaw. Could you relax or soften your jaw? And feel now the inside of the mouth the lips, the tongue. Feel the volume of your shoulders and feel the weight of your arms. Imagine if you like the, the weight of the arms, the feeling of the heaviness and the weight of the arms calling you into a deeper sense of relaxed presence inside. Could you soften your palms? Feel from the inside the palms, fingers, thumbs. Could you relax or soften your throat? The lungs and the heart. Is it possible to soften or relax your lower back and the buttocks? And now feel from the inside the movement of the belly as you breathe. The more you soften, the more intimately you can feel the subtlety of the breath down below the navel. Could you in any way relax and soften down through the floor of the pelvis? Feel the hip joints. And 
and feel the length and the volume and the weight of your legs. Tops of your feet, the toes. And sensing from the inside now the soles of the feet and the heels. Is it possible to relax and soften the whole body even more right now? Bringing your attention, if you wish to, an anchor of your choosing to the breath or to sound, maybe the feeling in the palms, the the vibration, the subtlety, the tingling pulse in the palms. Any one of these anchors or any embodied anchor is a helpful way to stabilize your attention. And for this next period of time, let your intention be to experience your anchor from the inside, both relaxed and at the same time alert. If you'd like to sharpen your concentration a bit, and if your anchor is on the breath, you might explore counting your breath on the inhalation from one to five. If you lose count, you simply begin again and notice if you can both relax and also track your breath from one to five. Another option for stabilizing attention is to ask yourself, and again, this is with the anchor of the breath, is the length of this in-breath longer or shorter than the in-breath preceding?
one lens through which we view our our experience is through this lens of what we call clear seeing. Noticing what is happening right now. And you might notice if you can describe in a word or two your experience right now. The second lens is through this lens of of allowing, through this lens of what we could call loving awareness, of letting things be. First, ask, what am I experiencing right now? And second, is it possible to let this be? And if it feels right for you, you might notice your anchor, but also notice the periphery, notice the background. Noticing what's changing. And you might, if it feels right for you, let your awareness move from your anchor to a wider and broader perspective where you're aware of what's changing and perhaps even aware of of who you are as the meditator with this fundamental inquiry. What is happening? Can I name it? And can I let it be? If you notice your mind far away, is it possible to smile inwardly and to invite your attention back? You might again soften or could relax right now inside. And you might again take some time, both through this sense of deep relaxation to feel from the inside your anchor And as it feels right for you, you might open your awareness again to the periphery, to the sense of what is changing. You might again refresh your practice. Take some time to sense what could soften inside right now. 
Could you soften and feel the inside of your mouth? Sensing the belly beneath the navel. Softening, sensing the palms, the volume of the hands. The soles of the feet and the heels. Deep relaxation. The second element of stabilizing your attention, or what we could call focus. And here you might bring your attention to your anchor. Blending deep relaxation with awareness of feeling, sensing your anchor from the inside. And from this place of focus, if it feels right for you, you might open to what we can think of as flow widening your awareness to the periphery beyond your anchor, noticing all that is changing and the weather systems of mood, thought, sensation. Noticing change and noticing that which is aware of change. What could soften right now? What is happening right now? Is it possible to let this be just as it is? In these remaining five minutes or so, you might refresh your practice. Again, ask inside what could soften right now. Or you might let your awareness rest, for example, in the palms of the hands. Let awareness flood into your palms. Relax and feel any sense of pulse or tingling. Over the next three breaths, notice how much more you can soften on the exhalation. And 
And how intimately can you feel or make contact with your anchor from the inside? Focus or stabilizing is a gathering of attention. When you're connected with your anchor or with the felt sense of here and now, there is this sense of arriving. Perhaps a sense of homecoming. And from this place of here and now, you can widen your attention to this sense of flow, sensing the stream Sensing the parade of phenomena, thoughts, mood, sensations, even different states. Reinforcing who you are as the witness, the observer of change. As we explore both focus and flow, it can open us to a stage of what we could call letting go or letting be. And here, if you like, let your anchor fall away. Let any sense of doing fall away. Is it possible to soften, to relax, and to feel? to be aware of what is changing and to allow it to change. You might imagine in this remaining minute or so that there is nowhere to go, there is nothing to do. Just simply to be, to rest in this ever-changing sense of here and now. And you might inquire right now as you sense both body and senses, mind and awareness. Is there anything that could soften or relax or let go? Anything that could relax or soften or let go even more? You might now very gently lengthen your in-breath just a little bit and soften on the out-breath. What is present right now? How would you describe your experience in a word or two right now? And is it possible to let this be just as it is? And you might, with your eyes closed, let your head drift a little bit to the left and to the right. Let your body move and shift and change in any way that feels right for you. If 
Feel free to reach your arms up overhead, stretch out to the side, let out any sounds. Ugh. Welcome. You may well be aware of an acronym, which is pretty present in the mindfulness world. That's very powerful for shifting your relationship to unpleasant states. So it's called RAIN, R-A-I-N, to recognize or realize what's presenting, to ask if you can allow or accept it, and if you can, to actively investigate what's there, and then to nurture what you find with, with loving awareness and then to kind of rest in presence after. I have another acronym which I wanted to share to you, which for me has been kind of a, an operative system uh, for me over, over many, many years. And, and I refer to this acronym as DRAIN, D-R-A-I-N. The D is to, to deny the unpleasant feelings arising inside. Just pretend they aren't there. If that doesn't work, then you move to the R of this equation, which is to actively repress them. See if you can really, really push them down. And if they keep coming up, then you need to move to the A, which is to, to assign blame to anyone who might be remotely responsible for what you're feeling inside. And hang on to that as deeply as you can. But if that persists, then you need to move to the I, which is to instigate something really dramatic to take your mind off what you're feeling and maybe reinforce that sense of blaming others. And finally, if that doesn't work, try the end. Uh, the first of the ends is to, to nullify any sense that these unpleasant feelings ha contain any important lessons for you. And the second is to negate anyone else's opinion or their point of view on the situation. So try that. It's uh, it, I've, I have uh, relied on this on drain, deny, repress, assign blame, instigate drama, nullify and negate for many, many years. Or you might want to explore more about RAIN, which I'm going to talk about here. So, you know, the question is, what do you do when you feel stuck? You know, what do you do when you feel like you just can't, you just can't budge out of a situation? Well, I would like to talk about this practice of RAIN, which is a foundational practice. If you're familiar with this, it'll be familiar with it, but I, hopefully I'll offer a couple nuances. And if you're not, this, is, this stuff can change your life. It certainly has for me. There are four elements I'd like to talk about. First is about this practice of seeing clearly, when you can ask yourself, what exactly is here? What is this? It takes some drilling down, takes some wisdom to see clearly. The second question you ask yourself is, well, can I be fully present to this? Can I allow this? And sometimes you can't, but when you can, it allows you to open up to insight and new possibilities. Third thing to explore is, is the sense of investigation. How, how intimately can I hold this? How intimately can I look a little bit closer at what's arising rather than turn away? This is the power of investigation. And the fourth is around the end, around nurturing. How, how does this respond to loving awareness? It's about finding whatever you find in your investigation, how to call on loving awareness as a way of of bringing more attention toward it. Um, it's often described as the lubrication that allows you to let go. So this is a little bit of what I'd like to explore. And again, the, the analogy, which is maybe overused, but I can't think of a better one, is from Joseph Campbell with his whole exploration of the hero's journey. Imagine a circle with a line through it, a horizontal line through it. Above the line is what you're aware of. Below the line is everything unseen and unfelt in your life. And when you choose to be more awake in your life, and you draw on these principles of mindfulness, 
it takes tremendous courage because you're swimming upstream against your conditioning. There's this incredible, immeasurable impact of turning toward what makes you anxious to see more clearly into the nature of reality and determine whether what makes you anxious is true or not. This is really the hero's journey. And I'm going to be peppering this little exploration with some, which, some words from Joseph Campbell, who was a pretty wise dude, I have to say. When you want to be awake, if you, if you want to be awake, you have to learn how to see clearly. That is to say, how to transcend your preferences, your embellishments, your hopes, your dreams, to see the reality of things. And as Joseph Campbell said, all the gods, all the heavens, all the hells are within you. And this is, what, this is what happens. As you're meditating or as you're merrily rolling along, something starts to arise. How do you work with that? So I'd like to tell you a story through the course of this talk. And I'm going to weave this through to talk about these different states and different questions and different elements of the RAIN practice. And this story comes from someone who uh, I met with privately during a meditation retreat, you know, deeply immersed in silence and walking and so forth. And, and she said in our interview, she said, you know, I came here to relax, but I'm feeling anything but relaxed. The more I try to relax in meditation, the more I'm aware of this just this background of tension. And, and when I relax, it's, it's, I don't know if it's, if it's feeling worse or I'm just coming in contact with what's really there. It's, it's like this clench inside. Sometimes it's subtle, sometimes it's more profound, but there's just a sense like something terrible is going to happen. And I don't know how to work with it. So that clench, <laughs> you know what that's like. You know, just that, that sense of unease, that, that something's wrong. Some people call, call it the, the spidey sense. <laughs> The Tibetans call it shempa, which literally translates as the clench. It's just that sense that something's off. Either something's wrong with me or something's wrong out there. Sometimes we know what it is, but a lot of times we don't know what it is. It's below the line. And that sense of disquiet can kind of run our lives. Because that, that sense of free-floating anxiety or this that free-floating sense of like it's not okay... That colors are your entire perspective, your perception of life. So seeing clearly, and if you would, Zen pop quiz, you can close your eyes, take three breaths, soften on the out breath. A question for you. What three words best to describe your inner experience right now? What three words best describe your inner experience right now? And the secondary question is, does, does giving your experience a name change anything? If you like, you can deepen your breath. If you like, you can open your eyes recognizing and realizing what's here. Incredibly, incredibly powerful. It's the power of naming. As some shamanic traditions say, when you name a fear, you take its power away. I don't know if that's 100% true, but I do know when I can name it, I've, I've severed my identification with it just a little bit. Something kind of opens up in that space. Sometimes naming something creates its own little sense of relaxation just to recognize, oh, that's what that is. Oh, I'm anxious. There's can softening sometimes. Sometimes it's more of a clench. And it's important to note here, and this is so, so critical, is that everything begins with a feeling. <laughs> if you're noticing yourself, you know, worried and it's a mental state, you can probably find that somatic state of worry inside. It might be a clench. It might be a butterflies. It might be a, um, a fist in your stomach. It might be a lump in your throat. But when we move into the investigation part, this becomes really, really important. 
So naming what's there, so helpful. So we have these emotions that are hard to work with. Sadness, anger, fear, disgust. Sometimes when you name either a thought or a feeling, just naming it, it will soften or, it, or it'll evaporate. In some traditions, they say how some, some thoughts and some feelings are self-liberating. That is to say, all you need to do is shine the light of awareness on them and they lose their grip, they lose their potency, and they just, poof, they soften, they evaporate, they, they shift in some way. Sometimes it doesn't. You have, you have a feeling, you have a, a sense of something energetic inside, and you name it and you realize, whoa, this thing is, this thing is solid. Some traditions, the translation for energy is demon. So demon, the idea of like, when you're fighting with your demons, you're fighting with energies. And when something arises and it's sticky, that is to say, you name it and it, it's not liberated, <laughs> The question then becomes, can you be with it? Can, can, you, can you allow it? And usually we're, we're just trained not to. We are biologically designed to move away from pain and move toward pleasure. But if you want to be awake, it's a different story. Because you can actually train yourself to look toward what is unpleasant and actually get curious about it. This is not easy, but as Joseph Campbell says, the cave you fear to enter holds the treasure you seek. An example, which I've shared before, when Tara, my wife, gets a certain look in her eyes and says, we need to talk. <laughs> I know it'll be good for me. I know I'll be grateful that we've done it, but nothing in me wants to have that talk. And this opens up the question of, can you be with it? Can you allow it? And so back to this interview on this retreat, when she kind of named her experience, this awareness of this, this dis-ease, this sort of clench, the sense that everywhere she looks, when she relaxes, it's not okay. It leads to the second question, which I asked her. I said, does it feel okay? Does it feel safe? to explore this? She, she thought about it for a moment. She said, not really, <laughs> to tell you the truth, but this is what I came for. And the other question I have is, if it's too much, can we stop? Now, this is an important part of this equation because you recognize and you ask if you can accept or allow, and we are so designed to muscle through and you really have to ask yourself, can I, can I say yes to this? So, for example, if you would, you can close your eyes again. Zen pop quiz, 30 seconds. Just take a nice, slow, deep breath and just think of something that's a little troubling you, something that's bothering you. Just something that's between you and feeling really happy. And if you can, just name it in a word or two. And explore this question. Is it okay to be with it right now? And notice if you say yes, what that feels like inside. And notice if you say no, what that feels like inside. And if you'd like, you can again open your eyes. Sometimes saying yes, it opens up like a, it's like this expansion. Sometimes when I say yes to something unpleasant, it's like my awareness becomes bigger than it. Sometimes saying no feels really empowering. So there's no right answer here. But you really have to ask yourself, when you are investigating something that's between you and feeling free or feeling happy, and you've named it, is it really okay? Is it time to be with it? And sometimes it's not right. You don't have enough energy. It takes, it takes energy. Maybe you don't have enough time. 
maybe you might get more trigger, or you might get flooded, or you might feel out of control if it feels like it's too much. So it's very important not to skip this step in the process. It's, it's really important. And I really can't emphasize this because so much of our of us have this, or I'll speak for myself, I kind of have this spiritual warrior thing, you know, that if something comes up, it's between me and feeling free. My job is to like nuke it, you know, figure it out and nuke it. <laughs> but that's not a particularly wise approach. If you are encountering something that feels like it might trigger both fear and helplessness, AKA trauma. If you feel like it's too much, it's not time. This is what you can do. You can, you can let it know you see it and let it know that your intention is to be with it. And another time when the conditions are different, your intention is to fully be with it and then turn your attention elsewhere. And sometimes people say, well, like, I can't, well, something in me feels like I really want to dive into this. Something is not so sure because I feel from anxiety, feel some anxiety. I would invite you to, when you ask that question, can I be with it? Ask, ask the felt sense of your body. Your body will give you a message. And sometimes, and I don't want to dwell on this too long, but it's really important. Sometimes, like when I'm working with people, I'll ask, does it feel okay to be with it? And they'll say, I didn't think so, but just asking the question made it, makes it possible. Or it might be, a l I can be with it a little bit longer, but I'm not sure I can be with it all, all at once. Really, really listen, because when you feel safe, that, that, that sense of inner safety will allow you to move deeper into the investigation. I was once offering a course, which was a kind of exploring this the power of these practices. And and she said, you know, you keep talking about investigating what's between you and feeling free. It's a highly intelligent, highly respected person who asked me this question. She said, why would I want to do this? Why would I want to turn over the rocks of my history? Why would I want to look at my regrets and my pain? I want to look forward. I don't want to look back. I don't want to look back on on what's been painful, I want to look forward to what's exciting me. Fair enough point. I go back to the circle and the line. Above the line is what you're aware of, below the line is what you're not aware of. Like many people, when you pause, when you really f turn your attention toward what it means to be fully alive, fully alive and vibrant, you may find that that which is undigested in your life will start to arise. And what I've found is when I can turn toward that which is undigested, and when I can really be with it, get familiar with it, access loving presence, I feel even more alive and more free. But it's the willingness to look at the shadow. You know, when I look closely at my fears, when I decide I'm not gonna figure it out, but just get more familiar with what's making me anxious, quite often I discover there was something I was needing that wasn't happening. And when I, when I kind of got that, the fear softened. So here's something Joseph Campbell said about this, that when you encounter something between you and feeling free, he talked about how Nietzsche really really changed his life. He said, at a certain moment in Nietzsche's life, the idea came to him of what he called the love of your fate. Whatever your fate is, whatever the hell happens, you say, this is what I need. It may look like a wreck, but go at it as though it were an opportunity, a challenge. If you bring love to that moment, not discouragement, you will find the strength is there. Any disaster you can survive is an improvement in your character, your stature, and your life. What a privilege. This is when the spontaneity of your own nature will have a chance to flow. I love that. Whatever the hell is happening, 
you say, this is what I need. Now, that being said, if you don't feel safe, do not push. Let it know you see it. Let it know another time you will be with it. Maybe you need a little more energy. Maybe you might need a little support or some facilitation. But you're not running away from it. You're letting it know that you can see it. So sometimes something arises and you, and you have the resilience. You have the energy. You have present moment awareness. You have curiosity. You have some excitement about learning what this is and becoming more aware. And when you're willing, it can be a little scary, but then you can move into the investigation piece. Because again, now you're investigating something below the line. And again, <laughs> as Joseph Campbell said, nothing is exciting if you know what the outcome is gonna be. And quite often when you can spend time hanging below the line into that murky, amorphous, felt sense of the body, something will arise that will bring a sense of greater clarity. You will see something you hadn't seen before. And so back to our story. As I was exploring with this woman, it was like, okay, here's the sense of dread and anxiety. I asked her to, to begin to, to describe what it, how it lives inside. We often use the term the felt sense. And the felt sense is how your body holds an emotion or a feeling. And usually it's in the midline in the core. It's either strong and unmistakable. It might flicker quite often. Quite often it's amorphous and vague. And so she began to explore. She closed her eyes. She began to kind of sense streaming attention toward the sense of unease of what she began to feel. Again, above the line is what you know, it's language, and below the line is feeling, that unformed, ambiguous sense. And she described this, this hot kind of bubbling clench below her sternum. And she said, I don't want to be with this right now. And I said, well, let's just check in. You can kind of ask internally, kind of ask the felt sense of your body, does it feel okay? Does it feel safe to be with this? A long pause, she said, yeah, I can be with it. So she hung out with it for a long time, the sense of bubbling heat below her sternum. I asked, one question you can ask, is there, is there an emotional word that resonates with this feeling? And she sat with her for a while and she said, no, it doesn't really even have a, have a name. I invited her just to be with it. The analogy I like is when you're hanging out with something that's below the line in somatic investigation, to imagine you're sitting on a park bench with it just kind of sensing it, getting familiar with it. So again, she just sat with it in meditation. I asked her this, this feeling inside, this sort of like hot bubbling clench beneath your sternum. Is there a sense of how old it is? And she said, this, this is really old. I said, this is like a really small girl and I could just feel the fear. And she described how this, this bubbling clench moved into kind of a small knot in her sternum. She said, this, this fear, she said, it's, it's just a fear of, of disappointing and, and falling short, letting people down. Long pause. And then she opened her eyes and she said, you know, when I was young, everyone told me I was really smart. They told me I was like this, one of the smartest kids in class and, and I did really well in school. But, but from that day on, I felt I had to be the best. And I had this knot that really, I'm realizing now, never went away because anything short of being the best was a failure. And another long pause, she said, I, I never took on new things because I didn't want to look bad. I didn't want to risk looking bad. And, and here I am at this retreat. I'm trying to meditate and I'm a failure. And then she broke into the really deep sobbing. You know that feeling inside that just something is wrong? 
and how the mind is desperately trying to figure it out. This practice of investigation is not about figuring it out, it's about getting more familiar with it, about, about how it lives on the inside. And this element of somatic inquiry, moving from the story to, to where that story lives on the inside, to locate it, is so critical to, to get a sense of what's, what's operating down here. And here she was, this very, very young age with this sense of, if I'm less than perfect, I'm a failure. Imagine the, the tension of carrying that through life into adulthood. How do, we, how do we let that go? How do we shift that? And again, back to Joseph Campbell, he said, we must be willing to get rid of the life we've planned so as to have the life that is waiting for us. The old skin has to be shed before the new one can come. And so for this woman, she's beginning to see more clearly what's there. For her, sensing the sense of perfectionism and sensing the, the tendrils, the roots of it, how deep it is. It's one thing to see it. And again, we talk about how insight meditation or Vipassana, I love this definition. It's about cultivating penetrating insights into the nature of reality. And for her, here's a pretty penetrating insight. Here is the software program that got installed without me being aware of it. That is absolutely running my life. It's one thing to see it. It's another to explore how to be with it. A quote from Joseph Campbell I love, where he says, the goal of life is to make your heartbeat match the beat of the universe, to match your nature with nature. And this leads to calling on the second wing of mindfulness, your capacity to be with, to, to hold what is here in loving awareness. And so recognizing, realizing that there is this clench inside, asking if she could allow it, make room for it, accept it, and then moving into investigation, primarily this, this somatic sense, and realizing that here is this, this clench, this grip that's been here for a really long time. And so as we move to the nurturing, this is such a challenging process for many people, but here's what happened with her. So I invited her just to sense that small girl, that little girl trying so hard to please and internalizing all that pressure. And I invited her to bring back her, her attention to the sense of how that, how that lived on the inside of that knot. And I asked her to describe the knot and she described in a lot of the details a very tightly bound fist, this black, dark fist below her sternum. I asked her to imagine the point of view of that fist, just to sense its perspective. And then I asked her this question, is there a sense of, of what this needs or, or how this wants you to be with it right now? It was a long pause and she said, it really wants me to know it's there just wants to be seen. So I invited her just to, to really let it know that she sees it, to see it fully. And I could see a softening over time, a softening through her face. And she said, well, you know, it's really happy to be seen. Now I'm just sensing it, it just needs some, it really needs some, some compassion. And I told her about something that, that Jack Cornfield had said. He said how when you investigate what's between you and feeling free, some of the time, not all the time, you can when you trace back the pain, it oftentimes goes back to a really to when you're really small, when you're a child. 
I said, you might explore this if it feels right for you to kind of just to invite that little girl who was told she was the smartest and internalized that, that need for perfection. You might just invite her on your lap and ask her what she needs. And that kind of worked for her. With her eyes closed, she silently just kind of wept for a while. And then I just invited her just to rest in presence, just to allow the whole thing to fall away and just sort of be with the sense of what she was feeling right now. And, and she reported just a, a tremendous sense of expansion and ease. And I invited her to invite that sense of expansion. How, how big could that, that sense of expansion get? This practice of nurturing, how do you do it for yourself? How do you access compassion for yourself? Some of us are pretty tapped in. You, you have a, a methodology for opening to compassion. Others of us feel like opening that door is hard because we're so trained in, in self-judgment and self all, all the selfing <laughs> that goes with it, <laughs> self-recrimination, et cetera, et cetera. So here are some of the things you can explore. For some people, just physical touch. If you, if, right now, if you, if you just bring your hand to your heart and close your eyes for a moment, and just sense what it's like to offer yourself a, just a gentle sense of touch, just caring touch, that alone can be a very powerful process. As you're exploring how to more reliably open to the sense of loving presence or loving awareness, you might think, is there, is there an ally or someone who you know loves you? And when you think about them, what does that feel like? Is there a teacher that you hold in reverence? or a tradition that, that represents for you a sense of awakened heart and mind. You know, another, another approach that some people find helpful, particularly people who are really struggling to bring kindness to themselves, is to explore if, if your best friend was feeling the way you were feeling. How would you, how would your heart respond to them? Could you offer that to yourself? For some people, they actually find it helpful to think of, of, of the inner child. For some people, it doesn't work. But whatever it may be for you, physical touch, an ally, a teacher, a tradition, how you might respond to a friend, inner child or just a phrase, I care about this suffering. It's so critical that you figure this out because <laughs> we all have our own wiring and we can figure out your sort of neurobiology to access loving presence. That makes a big difference. Again, as I said, this is the lubrication that kind of allow you to, to let go of what you're holding on to. Compassion, kindness, empathy. But there's more to, the, to this practice of recognizing, allowing, investigating, and, and nurturing. And that is to pay attention to what happens when you, when you pause afterward. I got trained in, in focusing, which is a, a form of somatic investigation, really, really powerful. But I noticed that many people who, were, who I was training with were psychologists and, uh, and therapists. And there was a sense of like, well, now that I felt a shift, let's move on to the next problem. <laughs> I was speaking with Dr. Jenlin, who was the founder of Focusing. I said, you know, for me, it's like when I feel a shift, that's what really interests me. Like, because something shifted my identity, like something was tight and held and now it's soft and open. Isn't that where we should be paying attention? And his eyes lit up. He said, that's, that's it. And I really invite you when you when you feel a shift, when you feel that, that expansion or softening, 
stream attention to that because that is a very, very interesting place where you're not, you're no longer as identified with the not and your attention, your awareness is more open to who you are as, as the awareness itself that can allow that to shift, it can allow that to move. So here we are in this, in this practice of navigating through life. We have just a little bit of time left, but I thought maybe we would just do a little, little personal walkthrough of, uh, of this practice. If you like, you can close your eyes. You might take three slow, deep breaths and And you might just let your attention move towards something that's kind of troubling to you. Something you can identify that's between you and feeling free, maybe an anxiety, a worry. And if you can imagine, you could just sort of describe it in a phrase or a sentence. We're going to move through these questions pretty quickly just to kind of get a little sense of it. If you have something in mind, we'll take a moment to explore the R, to recognize or realize the situation. If you were to describe this situation to another person in a phrase or a sentence, how would you describe it? You might take a quick scan of, of how you feel about this. And, how would you describe that in a word or two? What's the predominant emotion? And next, you might now ask yourself, is it okay to be with it? Can you allow or accept this and, and take a little time for the next few minutes to be with it? And just ask internally, ask your body, does it feel okay? If not, acknowledge it, let it know another time. Your intention is to be with it. And if so, you might now bring your attention to what it feels like inside. When you think about this issue, when you stream attention toward this issue, what felt sense begins to form? Can you locate it? It might be anywhere from the lower abdomen to the belly, in the heart, the throat, around the eyes. You might even ask yourself, at its most chronic, what does this feel like inside? Is there an emotional word that resonates with this feeling? Is there a sense of how old this is? Can you trace back this feeling? Maybe, maybe not. With the next three breaths, you might just take, a, take this time as you breathe, just to sense what it's like to be with it, as if you were sharing a park bench. Moving toward the end of this equation, is there a sense of how this wants you to be with it right now? If you were to hold this in some kind of loving presence, some compassion or kindness, how does it move or shift or change? And you might bring your hand to your heart or think if a, if a friend was feeling this, what might you offer them? And if you could offer that to yourself right now, what would that feel like? What would that be like? Letting yourself respond to this following question now. As you've taken just a few moments to kind of be with it, to get familiar with it, 
What advice do you have for yourself regarding this issue right now? And if you were to follow this, not perfectly, not all the time, but incline your attention toward that, what would that be like? Now, notice what may have shifted or changed just in these few minutes of exploration and Take a moment just to explore what it's like to put it all down, just rest in presence. What has shifted? What has changed? And you might track if there's any felt shift inside. Track if there's any sense of expansion or softening or whatever's there. Just a sense, can you let it be? Can you let it move? Can you let it flow? And imagine that which you have named, to just to hold it in, in vast space, holding yourself with a sense of kindness, of loving awareness. Joseph Campbell says in the hero's journey, eternity is not future, Eternity is not past. Eternity is a dimension of now. It is a dimension of the human spirit. Find that eternal event, dimension in yourself and you will ride through time and throughout the whole length of your days. You might, if you like, deepen your breath. You can let your eyes open. Inevitably, as you move through life, you will feel these promptings from below the line of awareness, the clench. And our choice fundamentally is either we can live in reaction or we can pause and turn toward that which we perceive to be between us and feeling free. When you can do it, when you can see clearly name what it is, when you can open and allow if that feels right, when you can stream attention to really look at the granularity of your experience and, and bring a sense of, of curiosity and loving awareness to that, quite often that which looked solid softens. And that sense of softening points back to our true nature, back to the capacity of, of embracing your life with this love of the mystery. Finally, Joseph Campbell said one of my favorite quotes. He said, if the path before you is clear, you're probably on someone else's path. <laughs> I love that line. We are constantly moving from the known to the unknown. And if we truly want to be awake, it requires that we develop a curiosity, a willingness to learn, to open, to see more and more clearly into the nature of reality. It's a tremendous calling that requires, as T.S. Eliot said, requires a commitment of not less than everything. It's scary and the rewards are, are boundless. And one of the best ways to go about it is in relationship with others. And it's truly a, a blessing in my life to be able to share these practices with you. And I wish you great ease and well-being and aliveness as you continue your journey. Thank you so much for your time and attention and best wishes to you in your practice and everywhere you feel called. <laughs>